الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونتوب إليه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام الحمد لله على نعمة الإيمان الحمد لله على نعمة الإحسان الحمد لله على نعمة حبيبنا وسيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين الحمد لله على نعمة القرآن الحمد لله على نعمه كلها ظاهرها وباطنها الحمد لله على يوم الجمعة يوم يتلاقى فيه المسلمون ويتلاقى فيه المؤمنون ويتبادلون السلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أما بعد I have spoken many times in the past about education and its centrality in the Islamic tradition. And today I want to continue with the focus on education because our tradition is a tradition based on education. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the last revelation that is to mankind and that's our understanding of the Quran and our belief that it's the last message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to mankind and also our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if you look at both the first word that Allah revealed in the book Al-Quran is Iqra read and that is a imperative verb repeated twice in the first five verses that revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had there been any other topic of importance and significance to have the last revelation beginning with it, it would have been something else. But Allah, by saying, Iqra, read, recite, started the last revelation with education. And not only that, we also see in the first few verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also referred to the pen. اقرأ باسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم. The first revelation is all about knowledge and its acquisition and the characteristics that is given to Allah سبحانه وتعالى is being described as a معلم as a teacher علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم that he taught man that which he knows not. So our tradition is centered on education, just like a tent is held with a center pole that holds the tent and then you build around it. Our tradition is built on education, on knowledge. And if you think of the multiplicity of references in the Quran to knowledge, acquisition of knowledge, pursuit of knowledge, it is monumental. The Prophet Sallallahu described himself as a mu'allim. Innama bu'ithtu mu'allima. Barely I was sent but as a teacher. And therefore his message being iqra, read, recite, being a book and then he himself being a teacher gives us a signification of education for our tradition and our Prophet and our last message. Now, I want to speak to you a little bit about two individuals in relation to knowledge from our past. One we often refer to, Ibn Khaldun, but the other we often don't really pay as much attention to him, even though he is very well known. And I will begin with the second person, which is Al Jahil. A name that does not really resonate with us, we don't know much about him, even though there's 
debates about his aqidah, right? Every day today, everybody debates about somebody's aqidah. But his contribution in terms of knowledge was monumental. Al Jahid wrote close to 200 works. And you know now, today in circles, if you write one book, nobody can talk to you. If you write two, you have to have an appointment. If you write three, then you actually have to go through stages just to reach to talk to the person. Al Jahid contribution is 200 words that he authored on a variety of topics, but one of the areas of his major contribution is the science of zoology, which is the science of study of animals. Now the interesting part is the science of zoology that he wrote about because Muslims were very prominent in trade and depending on animals for agriculture, and animal husbandry in general, so it was a natural development of having an interest in animals and trying to see how to address their needs. And that's where you could say that knowledge production is organically formed from the life and the processes that are around you. So Muslims paid attention to animals because they saw their relationship to the animal as a codependent relationship. I know in the modern day we, could, we're, we talk about taking attention, attending to animals and so on because there's a codependency. That codependency, Muslims understood it at such an earlier time and that's where the whole science of zoology developed to try to see how to attend to the animals. Now al -Jahil, can be said to be one of the founders of the science of zoology. Right? So it could be defined as one of the individuals who that field of zoology, he can be really spoken of as one of its founders. One of his most famous works is the book called The Animal, al Hayawan. Now the interesting part of his book is that he authored a book that part of it is observation of animal, part of it is Proverbs, part of it looking at the Qur'an and what the Qur'an had about the animals, part of it is looking at the Hadith and what the Hadith speaks about the animals, some of it looking at poetry and the similarities and the use of animals in poetry, and some of it also constructing speech where the animals are speaking. Many of us are familiar with the book Animal Farm. Actually, if you go back to Al-Hayawan, it was the work of Al-Jahid that inspired some of the works later on on using the animals as speaking object to engage in political social commentary on the contemporary without it being apparent that the person is critiquing the social political situation. So a very innovative way of making the animals critique by their voice without the human being there. So really al Jahid should be credited with that genre of writing and developing, development relative to his work. Another part, another work of his is al Bukhala, the misers, which is also a social, political, economic commentary on people. And he did it in such a way that it's so humorous. I know many people today watch TV and look at uh, John Stewart and all the nightly show to get some commentary. If you want really to see some profound commentary on the conditions of man and human being, you look at al Bukhara and see what al Jahiz was writing, commenting on the condition of people relative to miserliness. And his book has been translated, it's translated in English, you could access it as well. Right, so that's another form or another area of his contribution. But also in his book, he actually worked on detailed observation in a medical way on animals. Right, so and actually his books have medical descriptions for animals and how to treat the animals as well as what medicines could be draw, driven from various parts of the animals that could be used for the human being. Now I'm pointing to some of this contribution because at a certain point 
Muslims were inspired by the command of Allah to read, to learn, to think, to contemplate, to open the many vistas of knowledge that a human being can pursue. And in this context, thinking of the period that these developments occur, it all comes out during the period of Baghdad, the Dar al-Hikmah, the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, but House of Wisdom was one of the centers. You had another center that developed in Cairo. You had another center that developed in Tunisia. Another center that developed in Cordoba in Spain. Then you had another center that developed in Samarkand. You had another center that developed in Bukhara. And what was so exciting about it that different cities and municipalities were competing to see how they could actually form and develop scientific as well as scholarly uh, uh, development in their own cities. So it was actually a positive competition. Positive competition between the Egyptian and the Iraqis, the Muslims in Spain, the Muslims in Bukhara, in Samarkand. So there was a competition to do the best and to see how you could lift higher the tradition that was handed to you from generation and generation. So when we think about this energy, it's all we're centered and focused on taking the commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trying to see what can we learn from the sunnah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have placed on this earth. Now there is a critique that often is placed that the Muslim's mind was closed at a certain point. This critique that often is put that the debate between the rationalists or the, the scholars that were rationalists versus those who were literalists, it's constituted that to say Al-Ghazali closed the doors on rationality. That's just a completely orientalist, demented approach to understanding what took place in Islamic history. The debate that took place between Al-Ghazali and Ibn Rushd, Al-Ghazali and the Mu'tazilite had nothing to do with the utilization of rationality and logic. It was on matter of theological issues. It was not on matters of practical issues relative to society. And Al-Ghazali himself utilized rational discourse and logic in his debate and in his argumentation. What it trying to posit, and this is where you see some of the Orientalist logic, is that the basis of Muslim decline is basically that they have abandoned their rational mind, and that resulted in the steady decline of the Muslim, uh, uh, Muslim states, Muslim countries, and this often is used as a single causality. Anybody that gives you a single causality for anything, you should actually run them out the door because it's never a single causality that results in whether it's decline or uh, slowdown. The reason for slowdown and changes were multiple. But the, one of the key elements was corruption. Corruption took place in Muslim countries and we should not be surprised. Why? Because we're human. We're not divine. So corruption took place in our fighting so different municipalities, instead of competing to have the best scholar come into the city and author and give them resource, began to compete who could have a larger palace. Sounds familiar today. So competition between the various municipalities turned uh, into the focus and attention. Uh, unneeded and extended combat and fighting with one another resulted in taking out all of the resources. As this taking place, the, the Muslim dominion became fragmented. And that fragmentation results in a lack of concentration of resources. And then people from outside begins to look an opportunity to actually come and eat from your plate that is there. It is you collectively that made it possible for this to take place. In general, four principles that could bring about development and progress in society, and this is what we see happening in Baghdad. One is that you have to have enlightened leadership. You have to have enlightened leadership. 
A leadership that is able to give us the vision to do. Because if you can't envision, if you can't dream, you're only looking at your own feet. And if you're only looking at your feet, you're always going to stumble. The, in, the enlightened leadership is a leadership that can help inspire a society and look in a visionary way that then can get all of us collectively to do the best that we can do and then collectively we could build. So that's one of the conditions. Second, there has to be stability. There has to be stability, political stability. Safety and security, because you cannot think if, you're sh if, you have, if you have bullets or swords are flying over your head. You're trying to duck, either to get the glass of water because so before somebody shoots you, or to try to get some food to feed your family. So safety and security and stability are a prerequisite for such a change to take place and such an elevation of knowledge and knowledge production and uh, be able to give the work like al Jahid and others have produced for us. Third, there has to be resources. There has to be resources. The sultans, the khulafa, the umara, the elite and the Muslims set up the endowments, set up the resources that a scholar does not have to worry about anything. Students did not have to worry about anything other than being eating the knowledge and eating the information. It was said that the Khalifa advisor said to the Khalifa when he was giving scholars the weight of their books in gold as a reward. And the scholars started writing in larger print and having larger pieces of uh, paper in order to weigh the book more so that the gold amount would be higher. The Khalifa said, responded to his advice, said, had they known what they're giving us compared to what they are receiving from us, they will be asking for more. Meaning he valued the book much more valuable than the gold because the gold comes and goes, while the book essentially becomes part and parcel of generational transformation. So resources are a must, and the Muslims at a certain juncture during the 9th century uh, up to the 13th century, the resources were all directed at elevating the Muslim knowledge production. And that Muslim knowledge production became really what we today still are leaning on for many of the fields and we built upon it. The last point is that you have to have scholars. You have to have scholars, individuals that actually dedicate themselves to try to research and understand and work on the multiplicity of materials that are there. So if these four conditions can materialize, then really the heavens are the limits in terms of what a society can pursue. Now shifting to Ibn Khaldun. Shifting to Ibn Khaldun. Often we don't understand the magnanimity of a person like Ibn Khaldun. Let me tell you what the historian Arnold Tombi said about the work of Ibn Khaldun. He said the following. The historian Arnold Talbi said of the Muqaddimah, which is the introduction to history. Ibn Khaldun wrote a history and then he had a, a Muqaddimah, an introduction to history begins. He says the Muqaddimah, that is undoubtedly the greatest work of its kind that has ever been created by any mind in any time or place. Right? This is a historian from the 20th century, 1950s, right? wrote a multi-volume, 12 volume uh, history. And in his mind, looking at the Muqaddimah, introduction to history, it's the greatest work that a human mind has produced in history. So he's not talking about 20th century. He's not talking, he was, Einstein was there. Uh, da Vinci was there. Uh, Rousseau, he knew all of the uh, Western scientists of the canon. Aristotle, Plato, in his mind that the work that Ibn Khaldun produced is basically the greatest work in terms of human production. Now if you look at Ibn Khaldun's work, the Muqaddimah, it's a book about sociology. He is known to be the father of the field of sociology. And Ibn Khaldun is the father of the field of sociology. It is also his work, the Muqaddimah, is a work on economic theory. 
And actually just I reviewed a, an article that compares Ibn Khaldun's economic theory with Adam Smith's economic theory as it pertains to the excess labor in the market and how it's dealt with, as well as how the market is regulated. His work actually is far more authoritative and not far more powerful than Adam Smith. But so far for many Muslims, they will celebrate Adam Smith with his hidden hand in the market, which is more often is the bankers, and we have no notions about what is Islamic economics and the theory of economics that comes out from Ibn Khaldun and others. It is also his work is on political theory and state formation. His work is the proto-nationalist formation because he identified how state formation takes place and specifically how nationalist sentiments he attributed to tribal uh, solidarity, asabiyya, but in that our understanding is the prototype of nationalist understanding, so he actually offered or gave us a whole political theory in there, and then it's a work in history. So what I'm trying to present to you to understand that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to us, Iqra, we just completely aid whatever was available in the world. We never shied away from any subject or any area of knowledge because we understood if Allah lays the knowledge on earth, then it's up to us to go and get it. We always focus our gaze at the horizons. And people used to look at Muslims in envy to say, how are they able to do this? Because we were studying and getting education, accessing books, writing for no other reason other than knowledge itself because we understood that's a command from Allah to us. We never thought of knowledge and knowledge production as a utilitarian function. We never put one book equals $1,000, two books equals $10,000, three books mean I get to be an assistant to a CEO. We never in our history in the past thought of that way. If we get a job, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your risk is decreed to you from birth. It is not the degree that you get is the source of your risk. That's a whole delusional where we think it's because we have a Harvard or a Berkeley or any type of piece of paper that gives you the meaning of who you are. You are a great person because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you and placed you and accorded you all your provisions. All what you need is to go and do kas with dignity, with honor, and it's not the piece of paper. So knowledge for us was of a divine purpose. We are trying to understand Allah's sunnah in this world. We are trying to understand the patterns of Allah in this world, whether it's in sociology, economics, history, political science, in any field, including understanding the human being. Our psychology was rooted to understand what is this human being? What is our disease of the heart? What are the things that cause us to go this way or this way? How did for us to actually consolidate ourselves? All that was for us to discover the Sunnah of Allah. That's what Allah said, Wafi and Fusikum, in your own self. So as we reflect everything that we undertake, we undertake with trying to understand Allah's creation. And as such, that's what made the difference in our pursuit relative to knowledge and knowledge production. Now I want to end with the following, just not to take a lot of time. What we are lacking today is we're lacking an ability to envision. Because if you cannot dream and have a vision of what you want to do, you cannot actualize anything. The first act is actually to think, to dream. If you could dream of where you're going to be, then you at least can begin to take the steps that are needed to change your condition of where you are. But if you are incapable of envisioning and contemplate the possibilities, then you're always going to be where you are. And when you envision and begin to take action, failure is part of success. So don't worry about failure because if you don't fail, you're never going to learn the meaning of success. I'd rather have a person that failed time and time again, at least they're trying, than the person says, I am afraid from trying. Or I don't want to try because there is a possibility of failure. Failure is about learning. It's actually part of the scientific method because you try to do an experiment in science as well as anything. You actually try 
time and time again, and all of a sudden, after maybe the 50th try in the lab, it hits in you and you discover something that you were not actually thinking about it for two, in the initial part of the experiment. Many, many experiments and discoveries as a result of just being in the lab, doing the work, and then getting a discovery that you were not even thinking about. You were thinking about A, and all of a sudden you get a C, and C begins to be the, the thing that is marketed, and you were not even thinking about it. But at the root of it is actually being tenacious and audacious to think about the possibility that you are able to accomplish it. The last part is don't allow people to tell you what you cannot do. You should be a person that knows exactly who you are and you set yourself to do what you set yourself to do. Often Muslims, and this is something I write about, have developed double consciousness which is similar to the experience of African American from the work of Du Bois. That we think, we look at ourselves by means of others looking at our, ourselves and we begin to act and conduct ourselves according to how others are looking at us. So you're never looking and acting as yourself. You're acting and looking and interacting in your life through the lens of someone else that's trying to define you. And in doing so, you lose the sense of the purpose of who you are as a Muslim. That's a real problem of double consciousness that Muslims have reached that level and that we need to begin to say that we are able to be self-conscious and having self-purpose grounded in our tradition and be able to accomplish any goal that we set our mind to. الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونتوب إليه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون. This last part I want to begin for us to think different possibilities. Right, different possibilities. I am a person that thinks that the Muslims in this country are in a very good position to do tremendous and extraordinary things. We have one of the most educated cluster of people that the world knows in the Muslim world. As a class, if you think about the Muslims, are about six or seven million. It's basically the cream of the crop in the Muslim world. From the beginning of the immigration to here, to the 1965 immigration reform, to the silicon rush, to the business uh, community, we have one of the most educated cluster of people in the world. Second, we have, in my estimation, we have also a high concentration collectively, not individually, collectively of wealth. We have tremendous talents in all fields. Maybe I would say we need more in the social science and humanities, but we have across the spectrum. Here's what we're lacking. We have not been able to translate our individual talent and our individual financial well-being and our individual creativity to a collective effort to carry all of us together. All of us are attempting to create our own small boat to sail in the San Francisco Bay while trying to fix the small holes that are there and no, none of us are attempting to build a whole ship that could bring all of us together similar to the Noah Ark that needs to be built. And therefore the creativity for us, I don't have the answer, I have the vision that we are able to do tremendous things if we are able to unlock a way collectively for us to dream of how to constitute a community in here for my sense that we could make the ideal Muslim community, we could implement every aspect of our tradition, the only thing that you cannot implement is the hudud. Everything other than hudud, it could be implemented in our own community, without reference to any legal authority whatsoever. The question is that why we are unable to do that. I know you ask people, don't wait for anyone else. The person you're waiting for is you. Get up and you need to begin work. I would say we need to think of financial institutions. Collectively, in the Bay Area, we have 250,000 Muslims. We could create credit unions that could be the place where we deposit our money, and through that relationship, we could actually buy our own real estate cash across the Bay Area. We have 84 mosques. 
just collectively just estimated that they, if you take all their budget, we have almost on a monthly basis thousands and thousands of dollars that could actually empower this credit union. So that's, if somebody wants to dream and somebody wants to do that, let them look at how to set up a credit union for Muslims in the Bay Area that becomes a source of strength. And then we could loan people outside without interest because that's how Islam entered many parts of the world because they looked at us that we're trustworthy, we're acting in a very open way and we don't cheat people nor we want to take their money because they feel they're incapable or they need a loan. So that's a charge. Second, how for us to create businesses? I know there's a lot of people in the tech industry. Where are our startups? Where are our innovation collectively? <laughs> Why is it that some people can go and do Facebook and that for us we can't come together and do these types of initiatives collectively? That's another charge. If you want to dream, I want you to be the owner of Microsoft. I want you to be the owner of, of Facebook. I want you to be the owner of these companies. And I want you to start them up yourself. I, I want to see a Muhammad, a Khalid, a Khadija that says, Assalamu alaikum, I own this company and it's part of the Muslim community. That's what it means to dream and to look in big and have really elevating the community, community collectively. So that's another chart. Third, I know we have a university a college, a Tuna college. I want people to dream about opening many colleges. St. Mary's College has about 110 chapters colleges across this country. The Catholic. When they started their colleges, they were 1.5% they were of the population, the same number that we are today. They were able to create that infrastructure. Not only that, people rush. They had a waiting list, not from Catholics, from anyone else, because they actually created one of the best institutions that people were envious about. And similarly, their schools as well. That's what we need to do. I don't like to complain about what other, other people do, or why they're better than us, or why they're uh, uh, angry against Muslims. I do all the work on Islamophobia, but when it comes to work, it's just, it's work. They're human, I'm human. They have their talent, we have our talent, and it's about time for us just to get up and do the work and collectively change our community. That's where we need to dream, and that for me is really the meaning of Iqra, and that's the meaning of us looking at the Sunan in this world and partaking in building a new community similar to the community that was built in Baghdad and the House of and the House of Wisdom. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إني داع فأمن اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا بالخير شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي بالخير ولا يبضى عليك وإنه لا يذل من واليت تباركت ربنا وتعاليت ربنا ردنا إلى الإسلام ردا جميلا ربنا ردنا إلى الإسلام ردا جميلا ربنا ردنا إلى الإسلام ردا جميلا اللهم ألف ذات بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم ألف ذات بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم ألف ذات بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه يا رب العالمين اللهم خفف عن إخواننا المسلمين في كل مكان ونخصهم يا, ونخصهم يا ربنا في سوريا وفي فلسطين وفي كشمير وفي باكستان وصوماليا وفي كل مكان هم فيهم مضطهدون يا رب العالمين اللهم خفف عنهم اللهم خفف عنهم اللهم خفف عنهم وأخذ دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفشاء والمنكر البغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون